We're going to pick up where we left off. <clears throat> having done our exposition and having spoken to the enormity of the problem, and, and I barely scratched the surface. I can tell you I, I had to work very hard just to get all of the information just regarding the statistics down to a reasonable chunk. Uh, the the enormity of this at, is absolutely mind-boggling if you sit down and think what our nation has fallen into. So <clears throat> my purpose in doing two messages on this was to give our exposition first so that we have firm foundation for the things that I will now begin to unfold. We began... Um, after the exposition, with just a very brief look, not only of the enormity of those things, but a couple of other matters, now we will attempt to try to lay out some practical things, both to remember and some to apply. Certainly this won't apply to everyone, but I have no doubt that sooner or later most of us will know people or have friends or family uh, that are engaged in this. So would you please stand with me yet again, and we will read from the Holy Word of God. Uh, the Gospel according to Matthew chapter 5, verse 27. Let us give our hearts attention to the inspired and infallible and preserved Word of God. Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you, that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. And if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out, and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. And if thy right hand offend thee, cut it off and cast it from thee, for it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. Amen. Amen. May the Lord add his blessing to his word. Let's unite our hearts in prayer. Our Holy Father, we need thee every moment, every hour, every day. Lord, we thank Thee for the days of this conference thus far. We thank Thee for the Word taught to us and preached faithfully. We thank Thee for the blessed Word we just heard on submission. And I pray that it uh, will be used of Thy Spirit to do good to all of the dear women here and to the men. Father, now I ask as we come to this um, sobering subject, this distasteful subject, uh, but this Goliath out on the field, uh, help us to take, uh, Lord, the stones of thy word and bring down that enemy, at least in our congregations and in our families and in, among those that we know. Cleanse thy church, Lord. Help us now. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost manifested eternal, almighty creative power in the creation of the universe. The crown of that creative force was man and woman. As the opening chapters of Genesis teach us, God united Adam and Eve in the first marriage, which was to be the template for all marriages. Our sacred text tells us that marriage, and as we even heard before in the previous message, marriage is an honorable thing. The marriage bed is not to be defiled. But that is precisely 
what pornography does. It defiles the marriage bed. Honorable pertains to something of high status involving both honor and respect. In other words, the Spirit of God is saying to us, when you think of marriage, think of something of exceptional value. Think of marriage as something of exceptional value and hold it in honor. Pornography, by its very nature, undermines every aspect of honor within marriage. In his book on marriage, published in 1542, the Puritan Thomas Beckin wrote, Matrimony is a high, holy, and blessed order of life, ordained not of man, but of God, wherein one man and one woman are coupled and knit together in one flesh and one body in the fear and love of God by the free, loving, hearty, and good consent of them both, to the intent that they too, T-W-O, that they too may dwell together as one flesh and body, of one will and mind, in all honesty, virtue, and godliness, and spend their lives in equal partaking of all such things as God shall send them with thanksgiving. <clears throat> as I mentioned in the last message, and as I said before you again, that is impossible to pursue when pornography is in the picture. We could take the time, and we don't have it, to take almost every clause in that lengthy sentence and explanation and show where pornography lines it up in the crosshairs and shoots right at it. These things are either or. They're not both and. They cannot be made to work together. When Christ said that looking upon a woman to lust after her was adultery, was, is adultery, the, the very fact that a man or a woman bringing that into the marriage relation defiles it because it is by nature adultery. I can tell you that there is among some pastors right now a great theological discussion going on as to whether pornography is actually grounds for divorce. At one time, uh, there were those that would say, oh, absolutely not. No, of course, you know, men make mistakes like this and we move on. At least it isn't real adultery. But Christ said it is. So... Uh, I do understand that there is a difference. I do understand that there is a difference between pictures and flesh and blood people. But we need to realize that very often thinking in those terms minimizes the issue at hand. And the last thing we want to do is, in a wrong way, minimize the violation that pornography is of marriage vows. The blessed institution of marriage is a beautiful picture of Christ and his eternal love for his bride, the church, which our beloved brother Scott has set before us in his two messages regarding headship and submission. That picture is vital. And your marriage, he's using the, uh, he used the illustration of painting. And I would simply say that your marriage is always speaking. Your marriage is always speaking talking. It's always saying something about Christ. It's always saying something about the church. And it's always saying something about your relation and profession of Christ. So uh, if I can say it this way, our, our marriages are noisy in one sense, that there's always something going on as we represent Christ in the world. 
We are always saying something with our marriage. And when we introduce pornography into it, what we are saying is that we are unfaithful. The church is the bride of Christ. This is why Satan attacks it craftily, mercilessly, and relentlessly. Adultery and promiscuity are at all time highs. Now they dip, they do go up and down, but they are really at exceptionally high statistics presently. Now, you know, statistics are not inspired, uh, and polls certainly aren't always right, as we have all learned in the last couple of weeks. <clears throat> so we, I, I, I'm willing to say depending on who's taking the poll and who's taking the statistics and what's motivated and all of that, we might get skewed numbers occasionally. But, but I can say that uh, at least the, the polls that I have seen uh, by those that would be professing Christian organizations, there's very little difference in the numbers. Now, this is really tragic. <clears throat> now, the battle for... Same-sex unions was settled by the Supreme Court last year. It's a great tragedy. I cannot call those unions marriage, not because of any hatred in my heart, but because biblically defined, marriage is between a man and a woman. Yet pornography promotes this idea. Pornography has been involved across the board in so many aspects of life, it is difficult for many of us to imagine. Entire books now and big ones are being written. Uh, the name of one of them is Pornified. It's talking about how this has affected our culture in ways that many of us don't even realize. Those who have been involved in it very often pick up on the signals right away. But not everybody realized that they're being conditioned. Before, I, before my conversion and before we got rid of our television, uh, my wife and I were sitting and watching one evening and I, a commercial came on and, and I was shocked. And, and I looked at her and I said... Uh, that commercial was filmed like pornography. She said, how do you know? I said, well, because I know. You don't understand how you're being sensually conditioned by virtually everything in our culture. And that is why the church of the Lord Jesus Christ needs to be a light and a beacon of purity. That is not possible when men and women in the congregation are filling their minds with that which is destructive, both of their marriage and their profession. Now, <clears throat> pornography, the LGBT movement, uh, the trans movement, the T of the LGBT, many of these things are clearly anti-biblical marriage. And uh, if any of you are interested, I can certainly recommend books um, that will show you how these things tie into a large number of world agendas, not the least of them being population control. So, Marriage is, is, has enemies standing all around it, but the most insidious is pornography because of the way, as I mentioned in the first message, many people think, well, I'm not really actively involved in pursuing someone. The Lord says that look of lust is adultery. And that puts that argument to rest. <clears throat> Pornography is a multi-billion dollar 
industry. So, in view of the multi-billion dollar industry, Christians should highly prize marriage more than ever. Now, let me say that there is an assumption behind the Lord's text, and that is marriage. 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 <clears throat> so I want to give you some incontrovertible facts, and I want you to think about them. There are eight of them. I don't expect you to remember them all at this point, but let me simply set these before you. First of all, you are a sexual being. Now, children, again, what I mean by that is you are either a boy or you are a girl. You are you will grow up to be a man or you will grow up to be a woman. Uh, girls' bodies have been wonderfully made by God to bear life. Uh, girls, you, you have an astonishing gift from the Lord in the way God has made you. Everything about your body as you grow and as you uh, become a woman speaks motherhood. That's what your body is able to do. Men can't carry children. Now, billions are being spent to attempt um, to make that happen. That is going on in our world. Um, but I can say to you at this particular point, where you sit, you are, a, you are a male or you are a female. And females have the blessed ability to carry life and to give birth to human beings made in the image of God. This is incontrovertible, no matter what science attempts to do. God has made man and woman, and we see it here in the scriptures. This is a passage you've read many times, but it is foundational to everything that we're going to be talking about. Turn to Genesis 1, verse 26. And God said, let us make man in our image, in our image, image bearers. This is astonishing. Now, we are not gods, but we are godlike. Because we are made in his image after our likeness, he said. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So, God created man in his own image. Brethren, this is an astonishing portion of this first chapter. Uh, as, as we see God in his almighty power creating, it is, it's overwhelming as you move from day one, day two, day three, and you see God speaking and the universe coming into existence with precision. Extraordinary. And to this day, with the best of our science, and, and as much as we learn, we continue to find that it is virtually a bottomless treasure of information as we continue looking at what God has made, the, the extraordinary immensity of things and the incredible things going on that we can't even see, taking powerful microscopes to even know such things exist. And in the midst of that, it's as if the Lord draws back the curtain and lets us be privy to the heavenly council. Let us make man in our image. We did not evolve. We were created and we reproduce after our own kind. This is fundamental. And so, God lets us hear this remarkable counsel, this outworking of his eternal purpose and decree. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them. That means he put his favor upon them. And he gave to them out of his goodness. And what is that? He blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, 
and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. Brethren, this is not a a side matter. This is the foundational matter. Jesus Christ himself, when he was being questioned regarding the issue of divorce in Matthew chapter 19, goes directly back here to the beginning. And that thinking underlies Matthew 5, when Jesus speaks of adultery, unfaithfulness to the God image bearer to whom you are married. This is sobering stuff, but it's incontrovertible. It is a fact. You are a man or a woman. You are a boy or a girl. You are a sexual being. Attraction to the opposite sex is good and healthy. It is good and healthy. Sometimes in an earnest desire to protect our children from the the filth and the things that we see in the world, we so close them in that we give them almost the impression that there's something wrong with their bodies and there's something wrong with being attracted to the other sex. That's a God-given thing. We must be very careful how we handle that. That takes skill, parental art. Children, your bodies are amazing things because God designed them. They're good things. It's good to be a girl. It's good to be a boy. And eventually, when you are attracted to a girl or a boy, God has made this. This all got to be this this must be wisely guided by the scriptures. Parents, you must be good and sit down with your children and encourage them. Someday you'll be a mommy. Someday you'll be a daddy. Someday you will establish a home for the Lord Jesus Christ and bring up children according to the word of God that will bring him great glory. But you violate that picture. You violate that wonderful gift of God when you introduce pornography into that, that holy union. It's a good thing to be attracted to someone of the opposite sex. But pornography utterly destroys the reason and the manner in which we view the other sex. Number three, marital intimacy with one's wife is the only God-blessed sexual activity. It is the only one. If you sit down and take Leviticus 17 and read on through, you will see what is called the Holiness Code, and you will find one way of men and women relating after another that God says, Listen carefully, death penalty, death penalty, death penalty. The idea of a man and a woman being united in Christ and united in marital bonds is the only, the only God-blessed activity. That is why bringing our children up in purity is so important. This underlies, again, what is being talked about in Matthew 5. Pornography is never about monogamy. It is never about one man and one woman in Christ loving him, giving themselves to one another, protecting one another, loving and encouraging one another, being companions on the way to the celestial city. Pornography is never about that. In fact, virtually every single thing, as I read in uh, the first sermon, almost every single forbidden activity between male and female in Leviticus 
is not only present in pornography, it is promoted. Now stop and think about cutting grooves into your mind and training yourself to respond, training yourself to respond to that upon which God has given the death penalty. This is very serious. My heart was broken at one time when a very fine young man that I know, not anybody here, no one has to wonder about that. Someone in, in a very far away state began a life, a double life, falling into the secret sins, which I talked about on the first day, <clears throat> or in my first message, and almost sequentially, he fell into one sin after another. Pornography was a large part of this, introduced him to many things, and before it was all over, no one had the slightest idea that he was involved in what he was involved. He, he became that good an actor and liar. And one after another of the activities that are giving the death penalty, he went to every one of them. Now, these are sad things. These depress the spirit. These oppress. These are not joyful things. But he was brought up in a Christian family. He was brought up and taught the truth. He was brought up and he heard the word. He knew the word. And to, for all appearances, he lived the word. Appeared to be a good father. Appeared to be a good husband. But all the time, living a double life. Right? This makes an absolute lie of husbands love your wives as Christ loves the church. It is a violation of this. All of these messages are coming together. This is kind of the grand central station message because the things that I've said, the things that Brother Scott has said, and as Brother Joel comes with his message on godly marriage, we will see how these things all interact together. Number four, the word of God condemns fornication, adultery, and homosexuality. Condemns them. There is never a time when it's given an okay, a pass in the Holy Scriptures. Never. This is incontrovertible. This is why we use that word. Children, the word, by the way, incontrovertible means impossible to deny. Impossible to dis. Prove. Fifthly, pornography is an act of fornication, mentally, adultery, and sometimes homosexuality. I was sitting and talking with a pastor about this very grievous thing, and we both had to admit to each other that when we used to hear the word, Father came to us, oh, I found my son, he's looking at these things. Or a mother, or on rare occasion, a young man would come and say, I've, I've, I've fallen into this. We would sit down and ask them a couple of questions. Nowadays, we have a list this long of things we've got to ask him. Have you been involved in this? Have you touched a child? Are you involved with another woman? I mean, these things are just unbelievable because these things promote this. Sixthly, pornography is a present plague in Christ's churches. I don't have to repeat that. That was uh, what a great chunk of the last message was about. Seventh, unrepentant pursuit of pornography leads to eternal destruction. It speaks of an unconverted soul. As with any sin, when we refuse to forsake, remember why Solomon said, confess and forsake and find mercy. That's God's 
glorious remedy. It's glorious. But when we do not pursue that, when we continue to live in rebellion against God, there is no hope, at least from the human perspective, that there's ever been the grace of God in the heart of that soul. Unrepentant sin. Now, understand what I'm saying there. This is a defiance. This is a refusing. God's people struggle all the time. I understand that. Pastors struggle. We wrestle. Certain thoughts come to our minds. Certain feelings, certain emotions can overtake you. Uh, there are temptations day in and day out. We may, we may fail at various moments, but we're, the, the Christian is about a life of repentance and turning to the Lord Jesus, looking to his glorious cross and knowing that he has forgiven us. The, unrepent, the unrepentant means I haven't let go of it and I'm still holding it. It would be like taking a viper and holding it close to your heart. And eighth, this is an incontrovertible fact. And if you forget all the rest, don't forget this one. Jesus Christ delivers men and women from sin. Sexual sin, pornography, all of these things. These are incontrovertible facts. And when we, and when we engage with our culture, when we engage with the issue of pornography, we've got to keep these things clear because pornography blurs the lines it blurs the lines between what marriage is, who's involved in it, what you do in it. What is the very purpose for conjugal relations? Is be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. Yes, of course, it is for bonding a man and a woman together as well. Well, let's go to some irrefutable facts about pornography then. <clears throat> William Struthers says men seem to be wired in such a way that pornography hijacks the proper functioning of their brains and has a long lasting effect on their thoughts and lives. We gave uh, examples of that, so we don't need to go further. But for those that, of you that were not with us, I would encourage you uh, to, to get... Uh, the secret sins message, which was the foundation for all the rest. Then our exposition of Matthew 5, 27 through 30 in the last message. And then beginning to come to these things with practical thoughts. So there are incontrovertible facts. We need to stand in them, not budge, knowing that pornography does everything it can to blur the lines and destroy the distinctions between biblical purity and worldly sexual activity. So, the first incon in incontrovertible uh, or irrefutable fact about pornography is that pornography mocks God's intention for marital relations. It's, as I said, it's never about, it's never, never about monogamy. It's always about the self. It's always about my pleasure. Pornography mocks God's intention for marital intimacy. Number two, pornography is inherently violent and perverse. And that's showing up in greater numbers than ever. Again, we are a mixed group and I simply cannot say some things that I would say to the men. But the only thing I can put before you is this. When men view pornography, the sexual energy that it kindles always has to go somewhere. Always. And one of the greatest tragedies in our day is that more and more it is being directed to children. I cannot go into the details of such a thing, but I can tell you that it is the case. It fuels <clears throat> pedophilia number three <clears throat> pornography 
Pornography is progressive. It is progressive. Here's a question for any man that's ever been involved. Have you ever been scared by the progressive nature of your sin? Because it doesn't just stop. No man looks at a picture and then just comes back to that picture for five or ten years. Doesn't happen. They go to more and to more. And after still pictures, it's moving pictures. And moving pictures usually finally motivates the looking in real life to act out what they have now programmed their minds with. It is progressive. It doesn't get better. It doesn't dry up. You will not quit it by yourself. Number four, pornography reshapes your heart in real and important ways. <clears throat> Struthers says, and this is similar to something I quoted in the last message, the result is that repeated exposure to pornography and the objectification of the female changes the way our brains see each other. These are literal transformations. Repeated exposure to any stimulus results in neurological circuit making, as he puts it. That is how we learn. It's actually a learning process. And so you, as a, as a father, sits down with his son or his daughter and says, now I'm going to teach you how to do this. And you show them and they do it. What do they have? Do, do they get it right the first time? No, they have to keep repeating, don't they? And they start getting it. And then the more they do it, the more they're able to do it. It's the learning process. And this issue of pornography hijacks the brain in that idea running right along those tracks it's teaching you it is instructing you i mean it is instruction from hell but that's what it that's what it's about this is how we learn and we are learning everything opposite to what the word of god says about purity and marriage He goes on to say, but what does pornography teach and how does it change those who regularly consume it? Well, more than anything else, as I mentioned in the last message, it keeps them from knowing how to relate to a real human being. And there is a demand for there to be a performance in a wife from the things that they have been viewing. This is evil. It is evil. But we have a generation that's been taught to expect things from women that very often get the death penalty in the word of God. This is absolutely proven by human experience and even now science validates it. Not that we need its validation. The word of God makes this clear. Just watch what happens to families in, in the scriptures when there is sexual sin. What happened to David? He was never the same man after Bathsheba. Never. And the, and the sorrow that God brought into his family following that act troubled him for a very, very long time. Brethren, this again is it's weighty. It's it's not the kind of thing that encourages us when we come to a conference, except in this. There is deliverance. We're almost to that part. <clears throat> Finally, these incontrovertible things are the fact that number uh, number six is that pornography is idolatrous. It is idolatrous. It becomes that which gives us our lives, what we live for, what, we're, what we can't wait for, that thing that gives us meaning day in and day out. It takes over. And what it actually does is turns us into self-worshippers. I live for my pleasure. 
You say, oh, I, I think you're overstating the case. Then you're not reading about this and you're not counseling people. Men lose their jobs over this. Men's and women's marriages fall apart because of this. The cost is unbelievable. I have a, a book in, in my library that, that talks about a man who was pulling down a six-figure paycheck and he lost everything because of internet porn. Now again, the, the wicked thing isn't the porn. It's the human heart. And you begin to bring those things into the heart and it's a formula for disaster. This man finally left his wife for a woman that he had met because of the wicked practices he began. And after they'd been together for a while, he discovered her committing cheating on him. Okay, does anybody imagine that you watch and fill your minds with these things and you live in a wicked life that breaks virtually every one of God's laws regarding relationships and then you expect someone to be faithful? That's insanity. Well, let's get to better news then. Uh, there are certain things we need to always bear in mind. And this is the first and the most important. There is, there is hope in this. There is deliverance in Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Very often people say, oh, well, you know, give me, the, give me that formula. Give me those five things that'll get me off of this. And it's like, well, I can give you five things. And sometimes they work for some fellows because they're mechanical. But the, 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 the thing that each one of us needs to understand is that we need to have the right relationship with God. And when we have the right relationship with God by faith in Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit, informed by the word of God, we can walk as Christ's free people. And that is true. That is absolutely true. What I will tell you is this regarding snares for Christians. We have lived for generations in this country with what is called decisionism. Well, you make a decision for your Christ. Now you're a Christian. Write it down in front of your Bible. Shake the preacher's hand. Uh, you're saved. Don't doubt it. <clears throat> this plague has been showing one thing after another regarding this sad religious debacle. It is proving that many have never ever been converted. Now I'm not saying that because a man has a problem with this that he's not converted. But I am saying that a very large number of them are. They've never ever truly repented and believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. When we don't preach the gospel as it is set before us in the scriptures, we are setting people up to take a religious fall. Jesus Christ is a willing savior. He is a mighty savior. And when men and women understand their sin under the, the, the truth of God's word, they turn from their sin, they change their minds, they look to Christ. They believe the gospel that the God-man came into this world to save his people from their sins. The eternal son of God became man. He lived in this world, keeping the law on behalf of his people, dying upon Calvary's cross because they had broken God's law. He rose again the third day. He ascended up into glory. He's seated at the Father's right hand. He is returning for His people. And we are one day closer. That Christ saves and transforms sinners. There must be the preaching of repentance. There must be preaching what real faith is. It's not a power that you have to get God to be your errand boy. It is that blessed hand that stretches out to take the promise of God. 
Jesus Christ truly delivers. So one of the problems in pornography is a lot of times people are simply not converted. And it's one of the easiest ways to channel them into bona fide sin and then to trap them into secret sin. Jesus Christ saves sinners. He not only has paid the penalty for their sins so that God declares them just, declares them righteous, but the Lord Jesus gives them a new heart. True Christianity begins with God's work, not ours. It, it is a true Christianity that comes by the power of God's Spirit, breathing life into a darkened soul, bringing the light of God's truth into the human heart and placing a principle of God's life within the human soul. We are alive in Christ. We're resurrected with Christ. We are brought into union with Christ. And therefore we have new desires. We have a new heart as the scripture talks about it. Decisionism tells you how to get God to do something. I let him save me. But the gospel sets before us the Lord Jesus Christ and calls men to repent of their sins and believe on the Lord Jesus. When people are truly converted, they are then able to resist sin. I don't mean perfectly. I'm not talking about perfectionism. But what I am talking about is that there is a principle of life. We are in union with the resurrected Savior. He moves in our hearts and our minds. His Spirit gives us light in the word, gives us strength for the day. One of the reasons we see many children go out into the world is because mom and daddy got them to repeat. Well, the Bible says this, the Bible says this. Do you believe it? Sure. Oh, good, he's saved. But then as soon as they get old enough and their hearts begin to manifest what they really are, we often see a very sad story. Conversion. You will never beat pornography in the biblical way without being converted. And Jesus really does deliver people. He really does. I have been free for 35 years and I never want to be a slave again. Jesus Christ very, uh, is, is the great deliverer. He saves us from the penalty of sin. He saves us from the power of sin. He saves us from the pleasures of sin. And the day is coming when he will save us from the very presence of sin. You say, well, I've heard that before. Is it alive in you? I didn't ask you if you had a nice big Bible. I didn't ask if you've had some religious feelings before. Do you have a new heart? Are you born again? Do you love what God loves? Do you desire what God desires? Is there that within you that no matter how feeble and no matter how much you're struggling, you want to honor the Christ that loves you with your life? Well, by looking to him, we have assurance that he will deliver us. He's our prophet to teach us the way of salvation. He's our priest who has offered up the sacrifice that God accepts on our behalf. He intercedes for us and he gives us the Holy Spirit so that we can understand God's eternal truth. Do you really believe that your sin is greater than that? It is not. God, uh, uh, I'm not saying that the struggles will not be incredible. But they can be victorious. And we have seen it. I have seen the Lord set men free in this congregation. They were living a double life. And God has opened their heart. He brought them to see the filth of their sin. The horror of their wickedness. The, the blackness and darkness of their double life. And the word of God came home to their hearts. And what happened? They were able to break those chains. 
Christ delivered them. Oh, are there temptations? Only when they're awake. But is there the strength to resist? Yes, there is. Now, this may be radical. Remember, the Lord said that there, it, it took radical steps to break this. He says, pull your right eye out, cut your right hand off, throw it away. He doesn't mean to literally do that. What he's saying is what you've got to do, no matter how biblically radical it is, you need to do that. I mean, for some men, before they make any progress, they've simply got to cut off any contact with the stuff. I mean, if you've got to get rid of the Internet, what's more important, your soul or the Internet? I am telling you right now that men and women and young boys and girls have skyrocketed the numbers of pornography use with smartphones. I'm not saying you can't have a smartphone. I'm saying that if you are sitting and using your smartphone for your, your, your porn, get rid of it. Get rid of it. If you don't get away from the source, why do you think you're not going to fall back into it? You've trained yourself to this. I keep myself accountable to my wife. If I go to a news site and I get flashed in those stinking sidebars, she gets the picture. She knows what I'm seeing. And she says, and what were you looking at? I've gotten to where I just tell her where I've been and what I was doing. Put it in the email. Accountability is absolutely central. Listen you're not going to stop this by yourself, or at least not for very long. I don't know if you have ever seen a boa constrictor or a python take its prey. It's one of those things in nature that I don't like seeing. But they, they clamp down somewhere on that body. When they can, they try to clamp on the head or the neck. But they'll go for an arm, a leg, and they clamp. And that clamp, that creature can't get, can't get loose. And then they start squirming, and they start flipping around, and they're trying to get away, but there's something bigger and heavier that's got a hold on them. And then, very slowly, it begins to coil around that body. Oh, I hate that. I'm, when I see that, it gives me chills. But I'll tell you what, one of those things, as we've talked about, there are all kinds of pictures going on right there. My friend, this is just exactly the way sins do. They slowly start coiling around, and you start feeling the compression of what's going on. You know it isn't right. You know it isn't good. But somehow, something's got a hold of you. You can't really break this thing. And you start trying to breathe. And as you take in a breath, it tightens up a little bit more. You try to take a little more breath, and it tightens up a little more. And it's a horrible way to see somebody go, to see a, a, a creature or even a human being. But brethren, that is just exactly the way this sin operates. It just utterly wraps itself around and slowly destroys. Jesus Christ delivers from this. But you need to cry out to him. This is where phony religion won't make the day. Well, what do you do? What do you do when you sin? As I said, you must guard your heart. You've got to re remove the stimuli. You need, to, you need to confess your sin as soon as possible. First, to the living God. I've sinned against you. And then you need to confess and make yourself accountable to somebody. Your spouse. You need to repent. Your elders. This isn't about being like priests and confessing to priests. This is about doing everything wise to stop the stimulation and to hold yourself in a biblical accountability. 
if you're not willing to do that, I have people tell me all the time, I'm really struggling. What do you mean by that? Well, I, you know, keep falling into this. Okay, well, um, still have the internet? Yeah. Um, okay, still got your, your smartphone? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Are you alone by, by yourself a lot? Yeah. <laughs> well, it's like, uh, is there a picture forming for you? Yeah, are, are you are you starting to get you're not going to stop this as long as it's available to you the eye the hand cut it off and then by God's grace remember you're involved in warfare cry out to the Lord Jesus Christ trust him look at the cross see your sin finished there man that sets the heart free what do you think Bunyan was writing about when Pilgrim looks up, he looks at the cross and he sees that body hanging upon the cross and the weight, the burden rolls away. What's going on there? Being set free. He's looked to Christ. He's seen his sin finished. And that gives him the motivation to go on and walk in freedom. When you sin, confess it. By God's grace, forsake it. And in order to forsake it, you will have to do some of these things. I mean, I've told, I've told young men, you need to get rid of that phone. Just get you a dumb phone like the one I have. By the way, everyone tries to send me pictures. They're about the size of a small postage stamp when you send them. And I would have to do this to see it. <laughs> dumb phone's just fine if, if phone is for talking to people or to text people. That's fine. But if you cannot control that media, it needs to go. Nothing is worth your soul, your relationship with your wife. Well... There are three relationships that you must work on, and then we'll quit. There's far more to say. But if you don't understand the issue of confessing and forsaking, seeking the Lord's mercy, I'm not talking about anything legalistic. I'm talking about getting to Christ. <clears throat> Forsake, forsaking is, as we said yesterday, the idea of repenting, changing your mind. If you are truly wanting freedom, if you're truly repenting, then you'll need, you will do what you need to do and you'll hold yourself accountable. Again, spouses, elders, is one of the beauties of the local church, brothers and sisters who've been in the battle who can say, yeah, brother, I know what you're, what you're going through and I'll be praying with you and for you and I'm going to be asking you, what have you been doing with your eyes? How are you? Are you staying free? Stay free in the things of Christ. Three relationships that will help put an end to your slavery of pornography. Now we'll rush through these. And the first, of course, is your relationship with the Lord Jesus. Your relationship with the Lord Jesus. If Brother Beakey's messages have said anything to us, is that we should be if we are people filled with the Spirit of God, alive in the Spirit, we should be people who pray. Not just at dinner, thank you, Lord, for this food. Not just when you're in trouble, help, lost my job. But someone who seeks the face of Christ, who longs to walk with the Lord Jesus, who loves Him because He first loved you. Brethren, there's a liberty in that beyond anything I've ever known. Prayer, prayer and the word, prayer and the word. A relationship with Jesus Christ is a real thing because you're in union with him. His spirit dwells within you. His spirit illuminates the scriptures for you, gives you the power to, to yearn for holiness Yearn to be free. Yearn to walk in purity. I've never met a regenerate soul that wasn't like that. But I've met lots of professing Christians 
who aren't. No life. Oh, to know Christ. As Brother Vicky was talking about Octavius Winslow. I rarely say anything like this, but I, if I could preach like someone, I would love for it to come out sounding like Octavius Winslow. So Christ-centered. I love Spurgeon, too. Well, your relationship with Christ is absolutely vital. But, and it's not just something on your own. It's not just simply the prayer in the word in private. That's important. But being vitally involved in the local church, which is Christ's body, having your brothers and sisters there to encourage you, to reprove you, to, in, to build you up, to edify you. Secondly, if you're married, your relationship with your wife, because you have been damaging it. You have been violating your marriage vows with pornography. And vice versa in those rare instances where it's a woman instead. You need to say, I have sinned, not stop there. I have broken our vows. Will you forgive me? Read 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and see what real repentance looks like. Read Psalm 51 and see what real repentance looks like. Does anything come out of you that looks or sounds like this? Because it's simply the work of the Holy Spirit. It's that life. It's, it's like inside. It's like a, an instrument that, that, that isn't tuned up. And when the Spirit of God opens your heart, all of a sudden it slowly starts taking those strings and getting them in tune so it vibrates with a lovely chord. You begin to, to vibrate to the things of the Lord Jesus, if I can put it that way. You want Him. Are you alive? Are you alive in Christ? Well, get right with your wife as well as getting right with the Lord by grace through faith. Repent to your wife and make yourself accountable to her. Now, some wives are so tender hearted, they'll let their husbands go on doing this. Sure, I forgive you. Yes, I forgive you. Yes, I forgive you. The Lord said seven times 70. True. But sooner or later, you have to say, am, am I actually holding him accountable? Or am I helping him to go on with what he's doing? All right? There's a time. It's not at the beginning. But there's a time to go to your elders and say, we need help. Finally, your relationship with your church. Do you love the people of God? Do you walk with them? Are you ready to take their reproof? Do you love them so much? I mean, a friend of mine gave me wonderful reproof regarding my preaching. All I can do is thank the Lord that he loved me enough to say, here, here's what I recommend. Think about this. And it has had a wonderful effect. You know, of course, the flesh would like to say, yes, would someone say I'm the next sermon? I mean, the next Spurgeon, please. You know, that's nothing but idolatry. That is nothing but the flesh. Brother, can you take reproof? If, you're, if your brothers and sisters in the Lord truly love you, they will hold you accountable. Don't you want to be free? I do. Well, so much more to be said. This subject is so big. But I, I do want you to see. Stop and think with me, and then we will close. We have certain things set before us that are incontrovertible, irrefutable. We're in a spiritual war. <clears throat> you are, you are a, a male or a female. Attraction to the opposite sex is right and good and healthy when when overseen by the power of the Spirit and the Word of God, marital relations with one's wife is the only God-blessed activity, sexual activity. The Word of God condemns fornication, adultery, homosexuality. Pornography is an act of fornication, adultery, homosexuality. And pornography is a present plague, a present plague. An unrepentant pursuit ends in destruction. But Jesus Christ delivers from all. Those are incontrovertible. If you will walk in the truths of these things, you will begin to see the glory and the beauty of Christ and what it means to be free 
in Christ Jesus. Amen. Father, we thank thee for thy goodness. Please take these things and fill our hearts with them. Father, if there is a soul here, if there's a soul here that is in this bondage, if the python of pornography has clamped down on them and is encircling them, O oh Lord Jesus Christ, set them free. If they are unconverted, turn their hearts to Christ. If they are thy people and have fallen into this, O oh, chasten them, love them, deliver them. Bring them out so that they might rejoice in being Christ free people. Lord, cleanse this congregation, cleanse all of your congregations from this terrible plague. And, O oh Christ, make thy mighty presence known. In Jesus' name.